Hi, this is the lecture on phylogenetics, and we're going to learn how we do phylogenetics, why we do it, and how this relates to organizing the diversity of life, because life is very diverse. So the science of classifying the diversity of life is called systematics and phylogenetics. And this is where we go in and we identify name, and that, that particular endeavor is called taxonomy. And then we classify the species by reconstructing evolutionary relationships, which we call trees or phylogenies. Now the reason we do this is because we want a non-trivial classification system. We want a system that's repeatable, objective, and testable. Okay? We don't want to just organize life alphabetically. We want to do it on a system that is predictable where we get more out of it than what we put into it. A good example of this is the periodic table of elements. I know that all of the elements that have eight electrons in their outer electron shell are the noble gases and so forth. And so you this organization system is predictable. You get more out of it than what you put into it. And that's what we want to have also when we classify life. So the early attempts to uh, classify life after Plato and Aristotle um, talked about, you know, remember the, the ladder of life, um, Carlos Linnaeus came up with a way of naming organisms such that each organism has a spe uh, species name that consists of the genus name and then the species, so Panthera partis and then there's the rest of the organization. And if you look at this, this is a hierarchical organization, right? Just like, you know, the military or government or, or other types of hierarchical organizations. He suggested that life is organized hierarchical. Now what he missed is that this also could be represented as a tree. And so you can take that same information and organize it in a tree because trees are hierarchical. The first person to recognize this was actually Charles Darwin. Now, when we see this organization of a phylogenetic tree, it is the history of the descent of the group of organisms and also doubles as the classification system. This is a picture I took at a um, natural history museum and you can see these are all of the triceratops species and, they, and there is a tree that shows the relationships of the different triceratops species. So Darwin, as I said, was the first to actually come up with this idea of tree thinking, of putting the organization of life on a tr in a tree-like fashion. In fact, the only figure in Origin of Species is a tree. He came up with this idea, at least the first time that we know that this was recorded, was in his notebook B. He drew this little tree here and put, I think, up on the side. And what an amazing little uh, note here. And, you know, you can now put this on birth birthday cakes if, if you want. So. When we have trees, we need to know what they mean. And to understand what they mean, you need to know what they consist of. So they consist of branches, which are these branches here, and then nodes, or branching points, or connecting points. Nodes are also referred to, once we get organisms on this tree, they could be referred to as common ancestors. We also have on trees the element of time, where you have ancient to recent coming towards the tips. We also have the element of divergence. Now this is not always um, represented on trees, but when it is, it means that longer branches means more change, shorter branches less change. And the um, axis that goes horizontally on this tree, it means nothing. So it's just to simply spread the taxa out. So the way that you think about organizing life is something as simple as this. Kind of like you say, okay, here are two organisms and here's a third. Which two are most similar. And of course you look at the flies and you say, hey, they both have you know one pair of wings. If I had an, another organism on here, this beetle, now where would your circle go? Well, we would go around everything that has six legs. If I had another organism, now where would a circle go? Well, of course, the two mammals, and they both you know have hair. And then if I had another organism, a bacteria, now where would a circle go? Well, it would go around everything that is a eukaryote and multicellular, right? So this is, this is one way of thinking about how do you organize life? You look at things, are they similar, are they different, and you start drawing circles. And actually these circles are part of a, a body of, um, uh, it's called um, Venn diagrams or set theory where you basically put things in, in successively hierarchy, hierarchically more similar and uh, more different groups. Well, it turns out that Venn diagrams, or these circled groups, can also be represented as trees. So here's the tree representing that same information, where you have the two wings, the six legs, the hair, and the multicellular organisms. So this is what we want to do in phylogenetics, is make these trees. 
So the way that this is done is you collect data and the data gets put into a data matrix. So for these six organisms over here, here is the data matrix. Character number one for vertebral, for um, vertebrae or to having a backbone, they all have a backbone. Character number two for tetrapody, well only frog, skink, bird, chipmunk, and bat have tetrapody. The amnion, which is a specific membrane surrounding the amnion, all the skink, bird, chipmunk, and bat have it. And you may say, well, what about chipmunk and bat? Well, the placenta is a modified, is part of the placenta is a modified amniotic membrane. So skinks and birds, which both have true eggs, um, have this amnion and so do chipmunks and bats. Hair, chipmunks and bats only. And then scales, you need to be careful here because we're not talking about fish scales, but more reptilian-like scales. Skinks and birds both have those, and many people ask, where do birds have them? Well, on their legs, and in fact, their feathers are also scales, just inverted inside out, constructed a little bit differently, but they are um, derived from the same type of dermal structures as reptilian scales. So once you have your matrix all done, and this is what scientists will sit down and do, and you can do this also with molecular data, with A's, C's, G's, and T's at, di at different um, morpholo um, I'm sorry, different uh, uh, sites in, in DNA data, you then compare and you start basically saying, okay, all of these share the, the vertebral column. These share the tetrapody, these amnion and hairs and scales. And what we've done is drawn a Venn diagram. And again, Venn diagrams are equivalent to trees. And then you can put your characters on those trees. And the reason we do this is because we want to tell interesting stories about evolution. I mean, this is great. At this point also, we could, we could look at classification. Here are my mammals, you know, birds, reptiles, and so forth. But we can also tell about evolution. So this says that the ancestor to all of these organisms had tetrapody, or in other words, four limbs were evolved, and then all of the ancestors of those organisms, um, the, I mean, the ancestor to all of these organisms had four limbs, and so the descendants will likely have four limbs, or if they don't, like snakes, then they lost those in their evolutionary history. If you see something that appears twice on a tree, like this, where we have wings over here and wings over here, then you can ask the question, well, is that a homology or an analogy? And if you recall, homology is similarity due to common ancestry. And as you can see, the presence of wings in these two organisms is not due to a common ancestor having that. It's independent origin, so that would be analogy or convergent evolution. And the last thing I just want to talk about to reinforce here is when you see a tree, this branching point node or common ancestor is the indication to tell you which two organisms are most closely related to each other. So the bat and the chipmunk are each other's closest relative because they share a common ancestor that is most recent, in other words, higher up in the tree, right? Or a more recent common ancestor that is shared between organisms means that those two organisms are more closely related to each other. So you would not say that the frog and the skink are more closely related to each other than any of these other things, even though maybe you think you know, lizards and frogs are kind of similar. That would be incorrect because lizards and frogs do not share a most recent common ancestor. In fact, the lizards share a most recent common ancestor with birds. So lizards would be more closely related to birds than lizards are to frogs. Frogs, their most recent common ancestor to lizards is right here. And so therefore, frogs are equally related to lizards, birds, chipmunks, and bats because they share the same common ancestor with all of those organisms.